Hello again. Um, thank you to Colin Betts for being here. This is our fourth Iowa Archaeology Month live stream, and you should be able to watch us on both Facebook and YouTube. So Colin Betts is our only presenter who's not from the OSA this year. He's at Luther College. He's going to be presenting on remote sensing and effigy mounds. So I'm going to pull up his presentation and then disappear and let him do his thing. Oh, and just to remind you, um, this, we'll do a Q&A towards the end of the program. So at any time, just go ahead and put your questions in the comment box on Facebook and YouTube. I'll pop back in towards the end and help moderate those questions. So thank you, Colin. All right. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, thanks, everyone. Um, good afternoon. Um, as she said, my name's Colin Betts. I, I teach archaeology and anthropology at Luther College. Um, and what I want to do with my presentation this, this afternoon is just to talk about a, an ongoing research project I've been doing. Um, as you can see from the title, using remote sensing um, to look at effigy mounts. Um, and, sorry, here we go. Uh, and, and in particular, we've been working on two different sites. They're located in the same valley, um, right along the Mississippi River in Alamakee County. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that here. Jenny, you can see these are just a couple of, of, of site views um, in this case. But uh, I have some acknowledgments at the end, but I think it's important as well to, to just kind of uh, give a tip of the hat right away. Um, in particular, um, to kind of two, sort of two groups or two sets of individuals that have really made this research possible. On, on the first hand, um, I need to give a, a, a huge thanks to the, to the OSA, especially um, John Dershick and Lauren Oldner, um, the, the Iowa SHPO office um, and Dan Higginbottom, and then the, the OSA Indian Advisory Council um, in, in really kind of, uh, you know, making sure that this, this research was possible, was done correctly, um, was done appropriately. So their, their sort of feedback and guidance was really essential for this. And the second huge thank you is for the landowners. Um, these sites are on private property and they were you know, incredibly supportive, um, both in terms of their willingness to let us do the research at the site and also just providing um, both material and, uh, and, and moral support in the process of doing this research, which we've been doing over the past few years. Um, so these sites, the, the official site numbers are, are you can see there are 13 AM, 202 and 204. Um, and, and located in Alamakee County um, in Northeast Iowa. You can see from um, this map, they're located on these, these two sort of terrace remnants. Uh, the Mississippi River is right here. So they're within view both of each other and, and also the Mississippi River kind of in this small little interior valley. Um, at, these, at these two locations, at these two sites, uh, there are, uh, you can see in this case, nine different mounds. Um, four bears, if you want to call them that, or quadrupeds, um, four birds, two at one site, two at the other, um, as, as well as a linear mount. And, and the, sort of the purpose or the point um, behind this research was to, to use the geophysical survey, to use remote sensing, to get a sense for, you know, if we could identify traces of, of the techniques for mound construction, to start to look within this, this one particular grouping of mounds, to see if there were, were differences sort of between and within mounds in that case as a way of trying to understand and ultimately explain um, the variability in mound construction. Uh, so what I want to do sir, before I, I get to the results is, is very briefly is just to talk um, in, in a really concise way just about the effigy mound phenomenon as a whole, um, as well as, as remote sensing and, and geophysical surveys uh, to give you some background for the, the data I'm going to be presenting. It's probably important for me to give a caveat at this point in time too. Um, effigy mounds alone would be more than probably an hour lecture to do. Um, and, and as well as the geophysical research at this site is, is pretty complex, there's a lot. And so I'm just gonna kind of hit on some of the, sort of the major issues of the, the major points, but, but to talk in part about, you know, what we've learned so far and, and, and maybe how it's in, at least in part initially helped us to, to, to understand a little bit more about this phenomenon. Um, so these mounds were built during um, one part of the late woodland period. Um, and this, this effigy mound variant, roughly about 8650 to you know, 1100 AD. You can see the distribution on the map um, as well as where the, the particular site location is um, without going into a lot of details in terms of the, the, the people who made them. We know that you know, these were people who probably spent most of the year in small family-based groups. And, and the mounds were likely built at, at points in time in the year late spring and summer when they would, would aggregate together along um, big drainages, especially like the Mississippi River. One of the questions that, that, that comes up a lot from people is, is, you know, who built these mounds? A lot of times people ask what, what tribe built them? Um, and obviously, the, you know, the term late woodland is just an archeological term to describe 
um, a particular manifestation that we see in particular in the material culture. Um, and I think, you know, I, as I said, that the, probably the best answer I've ever heard from this, um, I was at a, a consultation meeting at Effigy Mounds National Monument, um, and some of the tribal representatives there were, were discussing this very issue. And, and the, sort of the, the response they had is just to say, well, you know, the, the best way to say this is, is the people are the ones who, who built these mounds. And, and what that, that phrase acknowledges is that these were people who were ancestral to the modern day tribes. Um, without you know, trying to pin it down to a specific group of people, I think for a lot of reasons, that's a really valid approach. So in thinking about who the, the modern day descendants might be of the people who built these mounds, um, from a tribal perspective, I think certainly the Iowa, the Oto, the Ho-Chunk, the Dakota, they all, they all recognize um, their ancestors' roles in building them. They also recognize the continued sacredness and importance of these sites. Um, so I, you know, I think for me that in, in part is, a, is a, probably the best way to think about this issue of, of who the people were who built them um, and how we can go about that process of understanding it. As the name Effigy Mounds suggests, the, this time period um, is defined by the practice of building mounds in a range of different forms. You know, there's the earlier sort of conical or round forms, but what we see is, is a switch to making mounds in the forms of a variety of different, you know, either animal-like forms. Um, in some cases, they're geometric. There's also some mounds, in particular in Wisconsin, that are in the form of, of, of human beings or things that have a human-like form. Um, and we find them in a range of different sort of settings and, and, and aggregations. In some cases, you'll just get single mounds. In other cases, you can get relatively large groups of them. Um, the sites I'm dealing with in this particular project are in a little bit unusual for the number of mounds in one location. And you find them in a lot of different locations around the landscape, always around drainages, but you know, ranging from ridge tops, benches, in some cases, relatively low terraces close to the river. Um, the other thing that's important to sort of acknowledge with this is that at one point in time, there were a, a lot more mounds in Iowa and the Midwest as a whole than there are currently. And for Iowa in particular, we only have roughly about 50 mounds that have survived. And those are scattered between about 70, or I'm sorry, 27 sites. Um, this is just a fragment of those that, that um, or a small portion of those that originally existed. We know from, you know, late, um, mid and late 19th century surveys that at one point in time, there were, there were hundreds of effigy mounds in the state of Iowa um, at, at probably about 60 different sites, um, many of those destroyed through development, agriculture, and other stuff in the 19th and 20th centuries. Um, so the ones we have left are, are, are very rare um, and, and obviously important resources, different vestiges of the, of the past um, in this area. There have only been a handful of mounds excavated, um, effigy mounds excavated in Iowa. Um, or in this local area. And, and it's important to kind of glean whatever information we can from this excavation data as a way of informing um, what we ultimately get in terms of the geophysical results. Um, David Ben has a, a really good summary of mound building as a whole in Northeast Iowa. Um, but one of the things that, that he sort of um, noted or was able to come up with in terms of a general summary is that from the limited excavations that can be done, we can identify a range of different um, sort of steps or stages, if you want to think of it that, that were involved in the process of building these mounts. Um, the first step was the removal of the topsoil or, or the creation of what's called an intaglio. And so for a lot of these, or for the mounds that were excavated, what we see is they actually excavated into the ground first. So they removed the topsoil and, and created the form of the mound as a depression in the soil and created this intaglio. Um, sometimes within this sort of depression, there might be a, a raised earthen platform or pedestal um, often find rock clusters sometimes that were burnt. So you'll get these uh, accumulations of pieces of limestone. Um, there, there can be burials within them. Um, and in some cases those occur in that depression, in that intaglio area, that, that mound floor. Uh, in creating that final mound form, they clearly used mostly topsoil um, taken from the surrounding area. There doesn't seem to be a lot of evidence for complex internal stratigraphy or layers within the mounds. And then within the body of the mound themselves, some of the other features that tend to show up um, or that we've seen are, are deposits of ash and charcoal, other burnt material. There'll be other intrusive, I, I put it in quotes because intrusive sort of implies that they, they weren't part of the original mound, but you find pits that were dug into the mound surface and then refilled. Um, and in some cases with these pits, you can also get burials that were then interred into the surface of the mound in, into these things. So these are the, the kinds of structures that we know exist in some. Um, it's an incomplete list. 
We don't necessarily know how these would be distributed between mounds, but we can simply say we know that in the few that have been excavated, these are the kinds of things that, that have turned up. Um, so in using remote sensing, um, there's, there's really kind of two, if you want to go this way, two primary reasons why remote sensing is in particular really well suited um, for studying effigy mounds. You can see the definition of remote sensing as a whole. Um, and really what it comes down to is, is the instruments we use are capable of measuring some aspect of the Earth's physical properties, um, some element of them. Um, and they do so in a non-invasive non way. And really what we're looking for then are, are the ways in which humans, human actions or human activities have altered those physical properties in a way that we can detect so that we can, we can see those, those alterations or those modifications against that background of sort of the, the, the natural sort of um, natural degree of, of the landscape and how they express that. Um, the other really important element of this, really for, for two reasons, is the fact that it's non-destructive and non-invasive. Um, and this is important for two reasons. I think, you know, principally it's the fact that these are sacred sites. They continue to have um, really important meaning for tribal groups. Um, and so for that reason, you know, using techniques that are non-destructive and non-invasive is absolutely essential in that case. Um, uh, another very important reason as well, as, as I talked about, we don't have many of these mounds left. And even of those roughly 50 that we have left, many of those have been, have been altered or modified or impacted in some way by historic factors. Um, these are an exceedingly rare, really valuable cultural resource. And, and for that reason, we very much want to minimize the extent that we can um, any sort of further modification or damage to them. And that's why remote sensing is, is really good for this as well, is it allows us to gather data to see things about um, these mounds and understand them better, but without having any sort of permanent impacts um, on the mounds. And so in this particular project, we use three different um, techniques. Um, and, and it's important in, in using these multiple techniques, I'll show in a little bit, they, they all can you know, have a slightly different um, view of what's going on beneath the soil. Uh, one of the techniques is electrical resistivity. Um, and, and as you can see from this, what it does is it, it just basically injects a, an electrical current into the soil and measures the amount of, uh, of resistance for that current passing from, from one probe to another. This, this bar across the bottom here just has metal probes that when they make contact with the ground, what they're doing is, is they're measuring that the resistance to that current passing from one to the other. In essence, what we're doing, right? So we're just measuring this variation in this in this resistivity across the site. Primarily, what we're measuring is the amount of water beneath the surface. Um, so, so when people dig holes, when people move soil around, what they're going to change is the ability of that soil to hold water in the form of some really small, you know, sort of spaces where that 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 water can reside. And so, the more moisture, the more water there is, um, the lower the resistivity. Um, I say lower, I'm sorry, the higher the moisture, the lower the resistivity, um, and the drier things are, the less moisture, the higher the resistivity reading. By the same token, introduced materials, um, so things like rock or other stuff will also change it. As the current has to flow around it, it'll produce higher, higher resistivity readings. So this is one way that we can start to look at this. Um, another way is by measuring really small variations in, in the local magnetic field or the magnetic gradient. Um, and there's several ways in which, which human actions can cause these changes to exist. Um, one of the things we know is that, that topsoil, that, that top darker level of soil, tends to be more magnetic than the subsoil. And so if you get the movement of soil, if you get accumulations of topsoil, if you get the removal of topsoil, it can make it more or less magnetic. Um, if there's materials that are introduced which have a different sort of magnetic signature than the surrounding natural soil, that can show up. Um, also, if there's if there's fire, um, there's a process by which if you heat up soil, it changes its magnetic characteristics and makes it more magnetic, and you can potentially see that as well. Um, an additional thing, and in this case, it's useful for finding evidence of disturbance. If there's things that are made out of ferrous metal, iron or steel, they basically represent little magnets, um, and those show up very strongly as well, um, in particular, um, very distinctive signatures, and so we can see their presence as well in the subsoil. The final technique that we used is ground penetrating radar. Um, and this simply projects an electromagnetic beam into the ground um, and it records the reflections of that. Uh, you can see from that, that um, bottom illustration, it's a really good example. So it encounters things which are different, um, which have a different dielectric constant. Um, 
what it will do is it'll alter the way in which that, that radar wave is reflected. And so you can look at both the intensity, the amplitude of that wave coming back to the surface, as well as how long it takes it to come back to the surface to, to get a picture of what's beneath the ground. Um, and also, which is in a way that the other techniques can, it can give you estimates for where those things are beneath the surface. So in using all three of these together and, and surveying the mounds with them, um, it gives it, it, it can give us kind of a composite picture of what's going on beneath the surface um, and how we can make sense of or identify some of the different processes involved in mound construction. And so what I'm going to do in this case is I'll sort of just start with two really general images in this case um, for the two primary techniques we use, which were the magnetic and the resistivity, and then talk more specifically about a couple of the takeaways. And so what you have in these two images are the, the, the magnetic um, results from these two different mound groups. And, and really the main takeaway from this, you can see in this case, you know, just convention, the darker, um, the darker shades, the black and the darker gray, just represent areas where um, you have what's called a positive magnetic anomaly, where you have an, an enhanced degree of magnetism. The lighter colors are where there's less. And so you can see across the board with each of these mounds, what we see is the mounds show up as being more magnetic than the surrounding topsoil. It's not surprising because we know they, they constructed the mounds predominantly from the topsoil. And so that's what, what you know, allows these to stand out, if you will. Um, a couple other things I'm just going to point out, you can see that it's not homogenous in that case. And we also do get some areas associated with the mounds, which are, are less magnetic. Um, and I'll talk in part about those. The other thing that I'm just going to point out, you can see, you notice on a few of these, if you look at the two bird mounds, you can see where these, these white and black sort of outlining for this survey, survey area. I'll also point out, you can see with this mound over here, um, you can see this. Those are the, the, the result or the representation of, of ferrous metal. In this case, it's the remains of barbed wire fences, um, which were put in to protect the mounds um, from, from cattle. But after they were removed, some of the little bits and traces of the wire and the wire stables that remain in the ground still show up. You can see a few of those little black and white spots sort of scattered throughout where smaller pieces of metal um, were, were deposited in the, in the topsoil. Uh, in terms of the sort of the overall resistivity results, in this case, you can see sort of the, the same picture. The mound show up in this case as being areas that are 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 more resistant, that higher resist have higher resistivity values. Um, in the same case with this, the scale we use is just that the the darker images are those where you have higher resistivity, the lighter are where it's less. And you can see the mound show up really, really discreetly, really distinctly as as areas of higher resistivity. This is also not a surprise. Um, the mounds are raised, they're probably more compacted, they're going to hold less moisture, it's gonna drain out of them faster. Um, because of that greater compaction, there'll be less capability or capacity to, to hold that moisture to begin with. Uh, and so what we see in this case is the mounds showing up as being distinct in that case. Um, the other thing that I'll mention though, is that even within that sort of tendency for the mounds to be more resistant or to have higher levels of resistivity, you can see as well that you do get some internal variation. And that's where the sort of the, the interesting part of this is, is where we see the variation both within and between the mounds and the extent to which they express um, this degree of either magnetism or, or resistivity. Um, so those are kind of the, the overall results in this case. And I can say, you know, we were thrilled with, with how it turned out um, and, and just sort of the quality of of these. Um, again, as I, as I mentioned, these are really complex. Um, and so what I want to do in this case is just for the next, you know, 10, 15 minutes or so is just talk about what for me at least are two of the big takeaways, um, the two takeaway elements that, 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 that you can kind of think of from these results. And, and so the first one I'll just sort of define as being that the mounds are more than meets the eye. I mean, the, the surface expression of these mounds are incredible. I mean, they are in their own right, just as, as those, those, um, sort of creations out of earth and, and the, the forms that they represent are, are really spectacular. Um, it's even more interesting when you see sort of what lies beneath the surface in this case and the extent to which we can identify and begin to identify some of the different aspects and some of the complexity that we see um, beneath the ground. The other, the other thing that I'll just sort of mention with this case, and, and it's maybe tied to this first, is this idea that the, you know, the medium is the message. And this is obviously taken from communication studies originally, but I think it's important to sort of highlight this idea that that soil wasn't simply a means of creating something, but the very material with which they were making these mounds um, 
was clearly significant in its own right and, and imbued with, with greater meaning. And, and I think we see maybe partially a reflection of that in at least one of these mounds um, that we can see in the geophysical results. So I'll talk about that as a second as well. So in terms of the more than the meets the eye and the complexity of construction, one of the things that we were able to identify is evidence for these pre-mound intaglios and, and virtually all the mounds. In fact, I think every single one of them has this to some extent. It shows up more clearly in some than others. One of the mounds where this, this pre-mound intaglio shows up really well is in the, the largest of these bird mounds. This is at this site, 13 AM 204. And so what you can see in these images is we have both the resistivity on the top and the magnetic images. Um, and so the, the way you can see this in these images, um, and it's fairly slight, but if you look especially around the tail, if you look along the wings, if you look along this upper wing and head area, you can see where there's this very faint light outline. And so what we see virtually around the entire um, perimeter of this mound is this, this area of, of much lower resistivity. Um, by the same token, if you look at the magnetic image, what you're seeing in this case, you can see the same sort of effect, but it shows up most clearly around this tail. You can see it has this very slight halo effect. Um, these aren't the only mounds where we find this. So one of the other bird mounds at the other side at 13 AM 202, you can see the same thing. You can see, especially along the tail, a little bit of the bottom part of these wings. You can see this really faint magnetic outlining in this case, and it's really subtle, but you can also see the same thing along the tail with the resistivity where you get this lighter outlining along the margins of this mound. Um, I'll just point out, you can see with this bird mound as well, um, a couple of the things. This is an old looter's pit that you can see in this upper part of the wing. And then you can see like, for example, this right here by the head, these are some of these, what are called dipoles, these little pieces of, of ferrous metal, iron or steel that you find scattered probably right in the surface in the upper, um, upper few centimeters of soil. Um, so the last one, so these are the two middle bear mounds on this site, 13 AM 202. And in particular, this is the one that stands out for me. You can see this is the resistivity data here. You can see, especially on the lower margin of this bear, how clearly outlined this bear is. Uh, this one really strikes me because, you know, this is sort of counter to the, the surfic, surface expression of this mound. Um, this is a mound that's really subtle in terms of its topographic relief. I mean, it's there, you can see it. But unlike, you know, for example, some of the other bird mounds, which you can just about trip over them, this one is much more subtle. And, and I think my expectation going in was that the, 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 the mounds that were the most subtle on the surface, I expected to probably be the most subtle with respect to um, the geophysical results. And even though the body of the mound in this case doesn't actually show up as being all that distinct from the surrounding soil, this, this outlining really does. And so this one for me, and I, I think the reason maybe why this, this intaglio, this, this, you know, this creation of this, this, this basin, the shape of the mound prior to the construction of the mound, it shows up the most clearly is because there's not as much of the, the overlying mound fill to obscure it. Uh, from a geophysical perspective, what we're seeing in this case is that in the creation of this basin, of this intaglio, in stripping away the topsoil, you're making a surface or an area that's going to be less magnetic because that more magnetic topsoil is now gone. And it, by the same token, by creating a basin form, you're creating something beneath the ground, which is going to likely, especially if that surface is compacted a little bit, it's going to tend to hold moisture a little bit better than the, the unmodified soil surrounding it. What we're seeing is just sort of the, the outline of the margins of this because the, the overlying mounded surface that was put up on top of it by virtue of being made out of topsoil that's more magnetic and also by being more resistant, um, it, it, it tends to obscure this outlining in the body of the mountain. We just likely see it along the edges where either it doesn't completely cover that basin or where it's not deep enough to completely obscure the traces of it. So that's one of those things where we can see things which aren't apparent on the surface that don't really have a topographic expression, but we're clearly an important part of, of mound building. The second thing that, that we find pretty ample evidence for. In fact, I think almost all the mounds, not exclusively, but, but almost all the mounds have this to some extent. Well, if you wanna call these intrusive pits, I think it's better to just think of it as being post-construction use. So, so these are things which occurred at some point after the mound was given its form, but that could have been relatively immediately. Um, I think in some cases we might be talking about years later, maybe decades later that these mounds continue to be used um, for, for ritual purposes. 
And I think one of the places that we can see this showing up the most clearly, in particular in this bear mount, so you can see we still have some of these pieces of, of metal on the surface, but you can see the outline of this bear mount, right? Here's the head, you can see the legs. The body as a whole is more magnetic, but in particular, if you look here, if you look here, even to a lesser extent here, this mound as well has them. These aren't the only ones, but we find these, these area or these pockets within the mound, um, which have even higher levels of, 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 or more positive magnetic anomalies, which indicate something going on. Um, and that's really probably two things. Um, it's either pits or areas where you have greater thickness of that, that top soil, that A horizon, or in other places, there's probably evidence for burning or burnt materials being inside the mounds or being deposited in the mounds, these ash and charcoal deposits, which are creating these areas of, um, of, of, of higher magnetic readings. Now with this first bear, so this is the one on the left that you saw, this is where using multiple techniques can be really interesting. So this is that first bear. Um, what I've done with this image is you can see both with the magnetic and the resistivity images. I've just used a display where the, 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 the highest readings in this case are just displayed as red. And, and what's fun is when you start to look for the, the, the correlations between these different anomalies, these different things that you're finding within those, and see where they show up in different techniques. So what you find is, so this one area in the head of this bear, um, kind of in that head neck area, you can see it shows up much more clearly in the resistivity. We have this area which much with much higher magnetic readings. It's spatially correlated with an area that also has really high resistivity readings. So there's something there, whether it's you know greater compaction or in this case maybe a different kind of material, which is resulting in greater resistivity to that electrical current. When we did the the radar survey, so what you can see if you if it, you can make it out, there's a, a a thin line here. What we did is we surveyed this mound with a series of transects using the radar. This line shows one of these transects. It's the one that happens to bisect this particular anomaly. That's what you're looking at here. It's basically a three-dimensional slice, a vertical slice or a profile of that part of the mound. And you can see these mounds are built on a hill slope. This has been corrected for the topography. You can see the slight outline of the mound in this little bulge here. But the important thing is, and this lines up where this is in this profile lines up with this spot. You can see this area here where there's more intense white and, and, and black reflections. And that's where there's something in this part of the mound, which is reflecting that radar signal with much more intensity, higher amplitude than the remainder of it. And, and so what this likely represents um, is an area where either you have a, a very heavily compacted surface um, or potentially you also have a, a, an, an accumulation of rocks. These would be probably flat, you know, thin pieces of limestone like you get, but it's one that's also associated with burning. And so we know that this may be one of these, these sub-mound sort of hearth or pit features because we can see all three of these, these, um, these techniques showing us something that's different in that particular area. Um, so the last thing that I want to I shouldn't say the last thing, but in, in terms of this complexity, the last one I want to show is this, the, the one bird mound, the really big bird mound had this really complex sort of set of, of anomalies or features within the tail. Um, so this is the tail of this largest bird. This is the, the resistivity. You can see that even though we have the mound as being more resistant, if you look on this side, you can see there's this one patch, which is much less resistant. Um, there's something going on there on sort of the half of this. So what we see in these two bottom images, as well as in this top, you've seen the radar profile. This is a radar profile from this line. What these two images represent are the accumulation of those, those radar profiles, which are then um, basically used to create a horizontal three-dimensional slice of what's beneath the surface. And so what we're seeing is in this area where we have um, less resistance, there's both something that's showing up here as, as reflecting the, the radar wave with more intensity. You can see that right here. You can see this is kind of that, that rounded surface of the tail. And you can see in these different slices at different depths, we can see in this area where this crosses this, there's sort of this, this general area, which is basically the same shape and size, where there's something that, that's of um, a physical characteristic that it's reflecting this, this radar wave with, with higher amplitude, with more, more energy of that radar wave. Um, exactly what that would be, in, in this case, actually, I think rather than rocks, I think it may be a really highly compacted surface. And, and I think potentially what we're seeing 
is, is one of these pedestal features where you have this raised area of soil. Um, I, I'm actually a little bit, it is still one of those I'm puzzling over. I think what may be happening, and the reason why we see the lower resistivity with this, is that it, it may be that because of this raised packed surface, it may not allow the moisture to drain through as readily as the other parts of the mound fill. And so in that area, you may basically be getting moisture kind of perching on top of this. It's staying a little bit wetter as opposed to the surrounding fill. And that may account for why we have this, this area. Um, so that in and of itself, I thought was really interesting. But, but when you also look at the magnetic part for this, for this bird, this is where it gets really interesting for me. Um, and so this is, the, this is the bird that we're talking about. You can see that area in the resistivity here, which is less resistant, um, but you'll notice that tail basically in, that, in, the, in the same portion, but, but directly opposite of where that is, we have an area that has the highest magnetic readings for this mount. In this case, the red with the, like kind of with the, the previous um, image that we had, it's showing us where we have the highest readings in this survey grid. And so the, the highest values we have are located in the tail of this bird as well. Um, the image that, that does this the most justice, if we take the outline of that area where we have those really high magnetic readings and we superimpose it on both the resistivity and the radar, you can see that there's, there's a direct, or I should say a direct inverse correlation is that the place where we have the highest magnetic readings is exactly where we don't have the higher res or the lower resistivity and the higher amplitude reflections. And so for me, making sense of this um, is I think what this may represent is that this mound was potentially built with one of these, these earthen pedestals in the tail, and it may have comprised the entire tail of this or most of the tail of this bird. And then at a later point in time, one of these, these secondary pits um, was excavated into it that, that potentially truncated um, it's also possible that, that it's not truncated and what we have are just these two different features which were created at the same time. But even within the tail of this one mound, we're seeing a lot of complexity um, in this thing. Um, and so for me, this was, you know, it, it's, 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 it's fantastic to sort of see these, these kinds of variations or this variability within, um, within these mounds. So the, the last message, right? So I said there was the two takeaways is the idea of the medium being the message. Um, and, and it comes to this idea uh, of soil, elements of the earth being symbolically integral ritual components in and of themselves. Um, and again, I think there may be at least one example uh, of this at this particular site. Um, and this is also with this very large bird mount. Um, and, and what's striking about this mount, um, and, and this is looking at the magnetic data, is that if you look, right, so the body of this bird, um, for the most part, is, is much higher in terms of the magnetic readings. The exception to that is in these wings. And if you look, and it shows that the most clearly in this wing, although it's certainly present in both, this one's just been modified a little bit. There's some, some um, uh, cattle trails and other things which have, have modified it a little bit. You'll notice this really clear line and this difference between the upper part of the wing um, which is defined by soil, which is more magnetic, and the lower part of the swing, which is defined by soil, which is much less magnetic than even the surrounding topsoil. Um, and it's important to note that that the the actual topographic, the physical wing of this bird, extends from here to here. So what we're seeing in this case, um, at least from a magnetic perspective, are two different kinds of soil, which in a in a patterned way were used to construct the wing of this, both wings of this bird. Um, and, and so, you know, this, this is not, how do I say that this is not, um, uh, um, isolated incident. And, and one of the things I think archeologically speaking that we're seeing evidence of and maybe becoming more aware of is the extent to which, um, there's other contexts in which we see soil or earth being used in this way, um, because of the, the particular qualities, the, the symbolic or ritual qualities, in particular, the colors and what they convey. Um, you know, one of the, the sites that, that, that um, sort of came to be known more recently um, in Western Iowa um, is, are, are these two um, in, in this case, and, and Bear Creek Archaeology as part of a DOT project um, discovered these, and this is the presence of geoglyphs. And you can see in this case, um, you can see the reference down here. In this case, what we see is, is these, 
these figures, these images, sort of, you know, you can think of them as being comparable to effigy mounds, but in a different way, being created in the subsoil. So you have this lighter colored subsoil where you have these images. Um, and what you're seeing in this one here is this, this bison up here. This is the, the hind quarters and, and the, the rear limbs being created using different colored soils, um, especially using darker soil um, and, and modified soil within these smaller trenches to create this image. Uh, closer to the site we're working on, culturally different, but closer. Um, excavations at the, at the Trumpelow site, in particular Little Bluff, found that in the stratigraphy of this mound, there was clearly a very intentional use of different colored sediments, um, very dark sediments and light sediments in this case, um, in the process of creating this mound and, and, and forming this ritual landscape that were undoubtedly used because of the symbolic components um, that dark soil and, and yellow or reddish soil so conveyed in this respect. Um, and so I guess I'll, I'll go back to, in this particular case, um, what we're likely looking at, right? If you want to think about how this works for this, this particular image, is we know that, and, and this is just a, this is not from these mounds. Um, we didn't excavate in any way. But in a general sense, the more magnetic topsoil is the darker soil, the less magnetic subsoil tends to be this, this B horizon, which is more orange, more yellow in color. What, when this mound is created, we likely would have seen is that the upper portion of this wing would have been darker in color, darker in appearance, in opposition to the lower portion of the swing, which would have been this, this lighter subsoil color. And so, it, at least in part, it, it seems like um, from the survey is that, that there was a very intentional use of, of the different kinds of soil in this one particular bird as a way of highlighting these, these contrasts. And so, again, that's another one of those elements that comes out from this, which for me is, is, is absolutely fascinating. Um, and, and this is a particular uh, thing which we haven't seen before. And I should point out that it's, it only seems to be in this particular pattern way in just this one mound at this site. Um, so as a general conclusion, um, you know, on, on the one hand, um, you know, effigy mounds are, are, are very interesting in, in understanding the effigy mound phenomenon because unlike a lot of elements of ritual, these do represent a really sort of, um, um, I don't want to, what's the word I want to use in this case, an element of, of, of this ritual behavior that we can get at, um, that we can access because it does have this very obvious material component. Um, so it gives us an insight into the, the religious and ritual behaviors of this point in time. And if we want to understand those ritual behaviors, we have to understand the nature by which it occurred, how the mounds were constructed, differences between them. Um, and, 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 you know, the other big takeaway is, is the extent to which these methods were really effective um, at not just identifying where the mounds were, but providing these details about differences both within and between the mounds and how they were constructed. Um, and so, so, you know, what we see is, is a, a, I mean, even though we did have a sense of mound complexity, the degree of mound complexity, be able to specify um, the different elements that went into the construction of these mounds, that they're more than just sort of, you know, basket loads of soil heaped up on the ground. Um, the other thing for me, obviously, I mentioned the symbolic part, is I think it's important to, to sort of recognize or acknowledge in this case is that, you know, the, the process of building mounds wasn't, wasn't, solely associated or um, that the end product wasn't necessarily the final goal. Um, so the process of building the mounds themselves was as important as the final mound um, in that, in that those, those, those ritual activities. It's also important to recognize that sort of the meaning of the mounds and even the, the ritual importance of the mounds likely didn't end with the completion of that mound form. And I think what we see with evidence maybe of some of these so-called intrusive pits um, or other elements may be the continued ritual use of these mounds, ritual practices on these mounds after their construction by the people who made them, you know, again, over what time scale it's, it's difficult to say. Okay, so as I mentioned, obviously there's a, there's a lot of thanks that go into this. I'll just mention again, as I said at the top, um, the OSA, the SHPO's office, especially the Indian Advisory Council for their feedback, um, you know, prior to this research and ensuring that, that um, we did it in a, in a, a manner that was appropriate um, for these mounds. Um, part of the, the research or the research was supported by an HRDP grant from the, the State Historical Society of Iowa. So that was absolutely instrumental in, in, in allowing us to conduct the research. Um, we also got funding for Luther College Dean's office. 
um, especially my, and I have to get another thanks for my two student researchers, um, Anna and Lynn, who are absolutely crucial in getting this done as well um, as, as tireless field workers. Um, the equipment we used was, was funded in large part by, by grants from the RJ McElroy and the Kenny Lindstrom Foundation. Um, uh, and and I, I, couldn't have, I couldn't have been successful in those efforts without the help of Jeannie Lovell, who's um, in the development office at Luther College, who helped me identify those. Um, so I guess with that, uh, and oh, I guess last but not least, obviously, um, the landowners as well, as I mentioned before, who, and, and this is a point I say, these mounds are on private property. Um, and, and I have to say that, that you know, you're probably not going to find a, a better preserved group of mounds or ones where you have landowners who are as conscientious about ensuring sort of the, the long term um, conservation of, of these mounds and, and the landscape on which they exist um, anywhere else. So that, that's also um, really important to recognize. So, all right. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. Um, I'll just remove your presentation, but yep. if any questions require a slide, we can pop sure. it back up. So there's a, a few questions uh, here and some comments, and that was just super interesting. So the first comment was from um, Shayla Big Soldier, who just said that her grandmother, an Iowa elder, and her family used to visit effigy mounds yearly when she was young. And um, there used to be some ceremonies and stuff at effigy mounds. Um, she's currently studying museum curation and mounds are a current topic. Um, and I'm just, I'm super excited to hear that because we definitely need more indigenous voices Absolutely. in this in this profession. I'm, I'm glad you were able to, glad you were able to, to tune into this and see it. So yeah. absolutely. So Bill Green asked, um, and this is a little bit of a recap, but does the mound yeah. fill generally cover the edges of the intaglio basins or does the fill stop short of the less magnetic edge? Yeah, and I mean, I guess, I guess the easiest answer, Bill, is I don't know. <laughs> Um, and, and, you know, I don't, I don't know if it would be possible to say, well, okay, so I guess I could look topographically. I guess I would say, I'm trying to think, I mean, so the difficulty is even when you use the topographic stuff, there's always that kind of gray zone between where does the mound actually start and where does it end? Um, and it's not always easy. You know, these mounds and a lot of mounds are, are you know, there's not a lot of, of topographic relief, 50 centimeters at, at most at, at the middle of them. My suspicion is I think it tends to be fairly close. I, I think um, you know the, the one the one mound that I showed, um, the bear mound, what has the really distinct um, outlining with the intaglio. I suspect that in that case, we're seeing that so clearly in part because it extends past it. I don't know if it would be really be possible to answer your question um, all that clearly without doing something invasive like probing, which in this case is is you know soil probing, which is out of the question. So. I probably should have just defaulted to my first first answer is to say I don't know. I, I think it's fairly close, um, and I don't think they extend particularly far beyond it. Um, but I think in some cases they do. Hopefully that answers it. And then related to that, um, does your data suggest anything about whether the mounds present day above ground dimensions differ from their original dimensions? Like, can you tell if there's been any erosion or redeposition? Yeah, there's, I mean, there's definitely been some. Um, there, it doesn't seem to be really substantial. Um, you know, in this case in particular, um, the resistivity data were the best. I mean, it, you know, you can see from some of those, I mean, they really showed the mound outlines very clearly. Um, and in almost all cases, those, um, those showed up and, and were very consistent with the, the topographic boundary of them. Um, so in that case, it doesn't seem like there was, there was a tremendous one. There is one of the mounds where you can see some evidence um, for some erosion in the body of the mound itself, one of the bears, I, I suspect that probably occurred pretty soon after it was constructed. Um, but I guess by and large, my sense from this is that there's a, a pretty close correspondence in this particular instance um, between you know the original boundaries of the mounds and 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 what we currently see in terms of their sort of topographic expression. Okay, hey, then a question from John Dorshik. Now that you've conducted several of these geophysical surveys on mounds, can you elaborate on lessons learned? What would you do differently if you could redo these studies? Yeah, well, I think the so so I guess the easiest answer is so I did this one first, and of course, you know, as my tendency is, I thought I knew everything after I did this one, and then we we did a different group this this spring. Um, and my initial reaction after doing these mounds is I'd use all the techniques, but but resistivity would be my first choice. And then I did a survey on a mound group that had a very different um, um, 
sort of soil base and sandy soils, and I had to throw that out the window. Um, so, so I guess the big lesson I've learned is not to get too cocky and assume I know what's going on with it. Um, no, I think I think you know the the biggest lessons, um, and one of the things I did apply in the second one is is to make sure um, to do the highest resolution possible. Um, there's no reason not to, um, in terms of the, the data collection as well, especially if time permits. Um, and and I don't know in, in terms of do differently. Um, yeah, I, I think, you know, part of it was also in, in the process, a lot of it's sort of ticky tacky field stuff. Um, we did modify, especially after the first group that we did, um, in this, you know, I, this was a, this site was a, a multi-season one and we just made some modifications to how we went about the process, um, how we ran the transects, how we spaced them, different things like that. So, um, yeah, I mean, in, in terms of bigger lessons, I mean, I, you know, I was thrilled. I think for me, the magnetic and the resistivity really work well. One of the struggles I've run into, I think radar has a lot of potential. Um, the struggle I've ran into with radar and both of these didn't show up as much in this is that the field conditions just weren't real suitable for it. Um, because they're vegetated, um, they have woody growth. It's really difficult to get the radar antenna to, to couple with the ground in the way you need to. And so it, it presents some problems, which... I don't really have solutions to. I think other places it might work better. Um, but the biggest lessons are just how effective, especially these two used, especially the magnetic and resistivity use in combination are. So, I mean, I should say the beauty of this is, this is what I love about, uh, about remote sensing is you can't always redo it, unlike regular excavation. You know, if, if you screw things up, um, there's a couple places where I went back and redid them because I wasn't happy with what I saw or I wanted to see if I could get different things, different, different settings, other stuff. Um, and and so I, I think that's the beauty of this too. Is you 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 can do do-overs with this if you have the time to put in for the field studies. So. And then sort of related, but Mary said so she came in late. But I don't think you mentioned this. Uh, one of the things Mary does with the drone survey is use infrared or FLIR thermal technology. Have you looked into that or thought about using it? I, I you know, I would love to use a range of more techniques. So she's volunteering, and yeah, and I know I, you know, I saw her presentation on on some mounds that they did in Wisconsin. I think, and I, I think there'd be, I think there'd be huge potential for that. I really do. I mean, and maybe I should answer this with John too. You know, to do, you know, there's other techniques, magnetic susceptibility. Um, you know, that they could also be incorporated. And, and I think that all of them have the potential to, to, um, to add to what we can say. So absolutely, um, no question about it. So I, I'd love to see that. I don't have the capability, so I haven't and can't. So Yeah, we definitely do. And so that, that yeah. survey that we did with the Ho-Chunk Nation, yeah. we uh, did some, some thermal drone um, survey of the Amound group. And that... It, it, it's the floor really shows what vegetation is holding in heat and moisture at certain times mm -hmm. of the day. And so through that survey, we could tell where they needed to be mowing because in the tall prairie grass, oh, they couldn't yeah. quite see the edges of the wings and that helped them modify their, their mowing plan a little bit. Um, but knowing that different types of soil retain different levels of moisture that might support different vegetation. Do you think that these mounds um, when they were first constructed, had any sort of differences in vegetation that maybe were apparent after the mounds were constructed? It's a good question. I don't know. Um, and you know, I, that would I, visually be really stunning. I think it, it would. Yeah, I, I can't answer that. Um, you know, I have no doubt. I, I think it was. I think these sites must have been must have been managed um, by the people who built them. I, I suspect burning and other things. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, all I can speak, you know, in terms of the the contemporary. The contemporary mounds, in particular, the, those two bird mounds, the, the landowner, you know, they're all in prairie, um, they're burned off, but the, the birds in particular, um, he mows around the mounds to, to keep the woody vegetation down. Um, and, and what's really phenomenal about these mounds is that you do get different vegetation that, that just sort of naturally grows up. Um, and the wild bergamot or, or wild horseman um, tends to grow up more. And so you do get different color blossoms in times of the year on the birds as opposed to the surrounding stuff. It's stunning. Whether that would have been the case, you know, prehistorically, I don't know. But I agree with you that that'd be a, that'd be pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. So when those pop up, you should let us know so we can get some drone pictures of that uh, as well. Because maybe, yes. it, yeah, it might look amazing Yeah, and, from and a I'll bird's make, eye view. I'll make sure, you know, with the next, I mean, hopefully we can do more of these types of things. But in the next round, I'll definitely be in touch because, you know, any sort of collaboration with that would be, that'd be fun. You know, the more the better. Uh, yeah. Some, some related questions on that. Any yeah. plans to study the mounds at Pine Creek on the old Ryan property? Yeah. So 
Uh, yeah, in fact, that, that's um, one of the projects that's that's in um, that's when we did this spring, actually. So that's one we're still kind of working up. Um, those are another really phenomenal, phenomenal group of mountains there as well. So, yes, yes, um, that's one that, that we've done. You know, hopefully, I mean, you know, in, in an ideal world, we'll be able to do this with a lot of the mountains that are left. Um, um, where possible. So yeah, and that that's related to John's next yeah. next question. Any plans for similar studies in the near future? Yeah, uh, you know, I've been in. Um, yes, I mean, I, I and I think, um, and this is, I know Bill at Green asked this question um, at a, at a previous presentation. I think yes, and, and one of the other ways of expanding this is to go from the known to the unknown. It'd be nice to do this with mounds that have been destroyed um, or at least partially modified. You know, there's some places where there are mounds that we know existed. Um, and, and they did similar work a number of years ago at the Turkey River Mounds. I, I think that would be that would be really useful as well because you know we know and Bill also did work with us. We know that they have an expression below the surface, so even with ones you can't see, there should be that. So that that's the other place that I'd really like to expand this too is is ones that we can't see to see what might still be sort of salvageable if you want to think of that in some ways. Yeah, yeah. there's yeah there's always more information to be learned. Yes. Um, and then again, related to the, the, the questions keep relating to what we're discussing, yeah. which is funny. Um, and this is more of a recap, but yeah. do you remember what percentage of mounds have been undisturbed versus yeah. excavated? Yeah. And a lot of mounds, of course, have been destroyed. Yeah. And so if you want to, in, in the general, if you want to lump sort of disturbed versus or destroyed versus extant, you know, I, someone asked me that too. I, I think I think conservatively 10% are left. I, I think even the ones we know existed, maybe 10% survived um, somewhere in there. Uh, in terms of, I, I don't know offhand, undisturbed versus excavated. You know, I think all of them have, I shouldn't say all of them, many of them have at least some disturbance. Um, I didn't talk about it with these. There's a few of these that were clearly have some potholes in them from, you know, looting that was done probably in the 19th, early 20th century. Um, not all of them, but there's a couple that do. I think many of the mounds have that. Um, so, so I, you know, I, I, I won't let you pin me down to a specific number in this. I would say depressingly few actually have been undisturbed, I think. And that's one of the other things these techniques are good at is that we can, we can also identify that. I didn't talk about it here, but there, there aren't many. There are some. And we saw that on this site. There's, there's certainly a few of these that haven't been modified. But unfortunately, the picture we have is a lot of them have. So, Yeah, and, and also many before the Iowa burial law was yes. passed and the NAGPRA, yes. many were excavated. Of course, we don't do that anymore. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I can't underscore the importance to our indigenous uh, partners and collaborators, what non-evasive techniques mean to them. Yes. So of course, yes. disturbing the ground is uh, not not a great thing. No. And no. just very against what many people believe. Um, yeah. And, and so, yeah. so this work is really important. So, yeah. So, thank you for that. Yeah. No, thank you for having that. And that's you know one of the things is in when we consulted with the the advisory council and the SHPO and the OSA was to make sure that you know we set up our grids that we weren't putting stakes in the middle of the mounds. You know, just a range of different things to be respectful um, and and to allow the research to be done, but to be done in a way that was consistent with their um, um, their beliefs in that case and their their requests. So it was a good process. Yeah. And I also want to emphasize that you don't have a big archaeology team at Luther. So it's undergraduate students that get to it do is. this this work and research. With yeah. this. How, how many students have you been able to work with on these projects so far? Uh, so, so, so obviously the main bulk of this, I had two students that we worked in the summer. Um, I've had several others, you know, in some cases, like the work we did this summer, I have volunteers who come out. So, so yeah, you know, we do it in a couple of different ways. If it's summer work, usually I can get a couple of students, a handful of students who will get paid to do it. Um, they kind of get fellowships basically through Luther. Um, in other cases, you know, sometimes it's on a volunteer basis where I'll just send out an email and say, hey, we're going to be doing this, you know, anyone who can come help out. So, yeah, I, you know, a, a number, I guess, is probably the way I'll say it. So it, it's phenomenal for them and for me. You know? Yeah, I, I think mean, it's, it's an amazing opportunity. Yeah, for it, it students. really is. So. Um, and then just two more comments, basically, sure. both are emphasizing their enthusiasm for, for studying um, right. Turkey River Mounds. Yeah, a bit uh, more. without a doubt, you know, and that here's the problem too is that you know the number of places I you know I've been in I've been in contact with Effigy Mountains National Monument too about maybe doing some work at the monument as well. Um, uh, but yeah, and that you know that is without question. I mean, that's Turkey River Mounds is one. I mean, you know, the, the site I worked at here this this is clearly a special place. Um, that's why the mounds are there. It's been that way for a long time, and to whatever way we can, you know, you, you go there and you can, you can still sort of feel it today as well. And so, yeah, no, I, I will, I will second those thoughts as well and say that w without a doubt. 
Yeah. Without a doubt. So it doesn't look like we have any more comments coming in and we're approaching an hour. So this, this might be a good place to cut it off. All right. Um, and then I'll just say like next week, I believe it's Wednesday, but it will be on our Facebook page is our last Iowa Archaeology Month live stream. And that's going to be a Q&A session with our state archaeologist, Don Dorshik. So he's not going to be doing a formal presentation, but this is an ongoing um, question and answer session where you can ask John anything. Awesome. Hey, thanks so much for setting these up, Elizabeth. I, this is this is a great resource. Um, I'm thrilled you asked me to do it, but having these live streams is it's phenomenal. So thank yeah, you so much. You it's really OSA a great way me. to reach so many more people than we could with an in-person presentation. Yeah, it's wonderful. So thank you again, and we'll say uh, goodbye until next week. All right. Thanks, everybody.